It's all it's politics. Um, why do you think Jesus thought that he was God? Um, because the earliest evidence suggests that he didn't think he was. Um, so what was his early evidence? Well, for example, if you look at the earliest gospel, uh, Gospel of Mark, this is what historians now consider to be the earliest written gospel, um, there's statements in there where Jesus appears to deny he is God. For example, Mark chapter 10, verse 17 and 18, where a man comes to Jesus and says, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, Why do you call me good? There's no one good but God alone. And then he says, Obey the commandments, obey the Jewish law. So here Jesus appears to be denying any divine status at all and, and positioning himself as a humble prophet. So maybe he's challenging who he's listening to. Maybe he's challenging who he's listening to. Yeah. Because the guy who he's chatting to doesn't think he's God. That's right. So let's see, I think he's using irony though. But Jews wouldn't think a guy walking around downtown Jerusalem was God anyway. It's unthinkable that Yahweh would be a, a guy walking around. I mean, no Jew would have ever thought that Jesus could have been God. It's, it's, it's really implausible anyway, historically, to think that a Jew could somehow think Jesus was God anyway, given the Jewish milieu. I mean, in a pagan world, yeah, uh, you get people who are great athletes or great poets or great emperors who are acclaimed as divine, sometimes even in their lifetime. But in a Jewish context, um, th that, that would be a very, a, a very different thing. So the default position was that he wouldn't have been thinking he was God anyway. He was a Jew, and yeah, yeah, uh, so I mean, yeah, it's, it's not like, something he would have thought. So the promise of Messiah was going to come. Yeah. But obviously, Jesus subverted the expectations of what that was going to be. They thought it was going to be yeah, a political ruler, somebody who was going to free them from the Roman Empire, etc., etc. Yes. Yeah. But, but not, uh, my understanding is no Jew uh, known to history prior to the rise of Christianity ever expected the Messiah would be, would be killed, would be crucified, and then rise on, uh, from the dead, or be divine, be God. This was a, a, a belief that was, uh, uh, we have no evidence that any Jew ever expected. They expected other kinds of Messiah, as you rightly say, that would be a, a, a king like David. That's why Jesus was hailed as a son of, uh, son of David, because that meant that he had that priestly, kingly, messiah role, uh, which was expected, and perhaps to liberate people from the oppression of the Romans and so on. But the, the, the messiah would be God in some way, or would die a horrible death, is, to my knowledge, completely unattested in any Jewish belief before people like Paul came along, Apostle Paul, and others later on after Jesus. What about Isaiah 52, 53? You read those passages? Yes. Well, uh, yeah, uh, if one reads those passages in their context, they're called, that passage, Isaiah 52, 53, is called a servant song. It, it's, uh, that's what scholars call it. And it's the fourth of, of uh, four servant songs. And if you read Isaiah in its context, back to Isaiah 46, and you read it all the way through, um, the, the, the servant, uh, is clearly identified as Israel. It's uh, quite it, a Jewish it, idea. Huh? It's quite a Jewish Oh, it was, idea, Isaiah, Isaiah was a prophet, was a Jewish prophet. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, this is what Jews today would say as well about that passage. They would say, oh no. I mean, Christians would say that's clearly Christ that's been spoken about. Whereas, yes. when you're reasoning with uh, Jewish people, they say, oh no, this is like an allusion to the nation of Israel. What, what, indeed, you're right. Um, what, what, what I was trying to do is look at historically. So when the author of Isaiah 52, 53, because there, there are probably three Isaiahs, but that's a different subject. Deutero Isaiah, the second Isaiah wrote the passages we're talking about. Um, if you read it in the historical context, uh, the servant it's referring to is uh, the people of God, Israel. And that's the standard view of biblical scholars now, uh, who try and be objective in their exegesis of these passages. Now, of course, Christians yeah. interpret it uh, as referring to the, the, the Messiah, but the passage itself never mentions the word Messiah, never mentions the Messiah at all. Uh, that, that's a later... Um, now, your reading could be correct, but it's not what the text itself says. Uh, that's a later understanding. And as I said before, no Jew known to history prior to the rise of Christianity ever thought that Isaiah 53 was about Jesus or about a Messiah. No, no one ever thought that. It wasn't, that's not how they interpret it. It's a highly poetic passage that's speaking about Israel's suffering in Babylon, in exile, that's the historical context, uh, and, and the way the nations view this servant um, with derision and so on. It is all po highly poetic language speaking of the exile of the people of God in Babylon. That's the literary historical context. But there's another meaning which Christians bring to it, which they think it refers to 
predicts the Messiah, uh, the Messiah. All I'm saying is that it's not required by the text itself. That's a belief you bring to it, I would argue. Well, do you not think maybe as a kind of scripture as a whole, like from, the, from the start, from Genesis, it's obvious that there one day will be a Messiah. And then throughout the continuation of scripture, Isaiah would then be pointed towards that. But what kind of Messiah? Someone who restores fallen mankind into a relationship with God. It, it, it is the idea, the central Christian idea from Paul in his letters, 1 Corinthians 15 and so on, is that the, the Christ would uh, suffer and die according to the scriptures and be buried, and on the third day he would rise again according to the scriptures. This is uh, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3, I think. Um, and so he explicitly says that the Jewish scriptures refer to a, a, a Messiah who would die and be buried and rise again on the third day. Now that's the explicit claim of the New Testament in Paul's lips in 1 Corinthians. This is all very well, but I don't know where it says that in the Jewish scriptures, anywhere. From Genesis all the way through to Malachi, or whatever the last book of the Bible is, they're different canons, sorry about this. Uh, they're, they, they just... It'd be weird down soon, uh, be, <laughs> be able to move. Well, you're, you, it'd be your turn to have them. Um, so the, prob the problem I have is I I I'm not aware anywhere in the Jewish scriptures, uh, anywhere, literally anywhere, where, where what Paul says is predicted, that the Messiah will die and be buried, and on the third day be raised again from the dead. I'm not aware anywhere in the Jewish Bible it says that at all. And so I'm left wondering why Paul said something that is, is not apparent in the scriptures he claims it to be in. And that's one of the problems I had with the Christian claim that it doesn't seem to be based on a, 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 an objective reading of the scriptures. Okay, well, I mean, I also probably say that he's referring to what he knows has happened. Yeah, exactly. Gospels, yeah, yeah so, so, well, the Gospels are written after Paul, but uh, he has this idea of what the Messiah is like. He, for him, the Messiah di did die and r r rise on the third day. And because he believes that is true, he looks, he expects to see it in the Jewish scriptures foretold, and therefore says that it is, because such a central event surely must be in the Jewish scriptures, but he doesn't say which scriptures they are. He never actually says in this quote, in, in Isaiah or Deuteronomy or Genesis or anywhere, a, a psalm perhaps. And so Christians have been left subsequently trying to find, well, what does Paul mean? Well, what are these passages? And in my view, they've not found any passages which explicitly speak of these events at all. So I, I'm left thinking that Paul's religion is not based on revelation, it's based on his own beliefs and his own vision, as he calls it, on the road to Damascus. Uh, in Acts, he calls what he saw of Jesus a vision. Um, and I believe he, he, I believe that Paul thought we had a vision. I can, lots of people have visions uh, of Jesus, of Mary, of uh, all sorts of people, it, even today. Catholics have visions of Mary en masse in uh, Fatima and Mujaguri, uh, in Lourdes. Um, this is normal in the religious experiences of humankind. The question is, is it, it, does it correlate accurately with the claim? And um, I, I don't see it. Maybe you can show me where. I think Psalm 16. Do you know Psalm 16? Remind me. Okay, well, it speaks about the promised Messiah. Goes through. Do you have a Bible handy? Oh, yeah, of course. Do you want to show the passage? I accept that the, the Jewish Bible does speak of a Messiah. The question is, is it the Christian Messiah, a dying and rising saviour God, or is it what I would see as a more secular or, or more uh, human Jesus, who uh, Messiah, I mean, who would be a prophet, a king, a, me a messenger sent to Israel to bring Israel back to the true faith. And I think the Islamic understanding of Jesus better fits the facts of history, that better fits the facts of the, Bi the Jewish Bible than the Christian one does. And that's one of the reasons I think Islam is true. Okay. Well, I mean, in Psalm 16, oh, just please. to get up for you, yep. it says, Therefore my heart is glad, and my tongue rejoices, my body will also rest secure, because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will let your faithful one see decay, let your faithful one, faithful servant, similar when to When he says me in that passage, who, who's the author of that psalm? At the very beginning of the psalm, he usually indicates... Obviously, I mean, David is obviously the author. So David is speaking. So David is speaking in this psalm, then, to read the actual. Yeah, yeah but do not. Well, I mean. So it's not. It's not a prophecy about another person. He's speaking in the first person, according to what you've just read, 
about himself, David, the king, king of Israel. So it, 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 the first problem we well, had I mean, then... I'm not saying that this ah. psalm is necessarily about Christ, but I'm saying that the only ah. way that, Christ, that David's okay. body can be abandoned to the grave is through what Christ has done, through the re death and resurrection of Christ. Ah. So but, conquered death. Okay, I, I hear I hear that's a Christian belief. I just I don't see that proclaimed or or spoken of in the Jewish scriptures as such. I, I can see why I know why I, I was a Christian myself, and I, I believe that it's a it's a belief one brings to the scriptures, the Jewish Bible, but it's not something that comes out of the Jewish scriptures. So you believe that Jesus is the Messiah who died and rise for your sins. And therefore, you go looking for passages that might fit that in the Bible. But they don't really, on an historical reading, mean that. They mean something quite different. But you believe, well, as a matter of faith, one believes it. And the Catholics have a wonderful term for it. It's called the census plenor. Uh, Catholics love the Latin. It means the fuller meaning. So yeah, they, they concede, Catholic apologists usually concede, yeah, Isaiah 53 is not about Jesus in its historical context, but there's a fuller meaning, the census plenor, the census meaning, the plenor meaning fuller, and census meaning meaning. Uh, we think that refers to our, our understanding of Jesus. So they kind of have their cake and eat it. <laughs> um, well, what do you think the good news is from a uh, Muslim? What's your hope in life at the moment? Well, the, the good news is, uh, as the Prophet Muhammad, upon whom be peace, taught, the good news is that God is uh, one of the key understandings of God in the Quran is that God is, is Rahman, He's merciful and compassionate. And the good news is that we're not lost. In our, in our sinfulness, in our, uh, in our wayfulness, that God is forgiving and merciful. So he doesn't demand that we reach certain standards before he forgives us. If only we will call on him, ask for forgiveness, uh, he has promised to forgive us. There's also bad news, there's a warning as well. So there's good news and there's a warning. For, for there to be good news, there has to be bad news. Well, the, the, the bad news is that if we obstinately, persistently refuse God's grace, uh, and refuse his forgiveness, then we will, in, if not in this life, in the next life, we will be lost. We will be uh, amongst the, those who are lost. And I see this message in, even in the Jesus, in the earliest Gospels as well. I see the same message that Jesus is preaching. He's not preaching his death and resurrection. He's preaching uh, a gracious, loving God and calling people back. You know, the, the, the amazing parables in Luke's Gospel, the power of the prodigal son, for example, is very Islamic. You know, uh, God's not a harsh uh, disciplinarian who, who demands that we reach, you know, he, he's forgiving, but we must accept his forgiveness. Um, so it's good news and there's a warning in the Quran. And, and that's also, we find that in on the lips of Jesus, even in the gospels we have today. So there's a continuity between Jesus and Muhammad, peace be upon them both, which I find incredible. And that shows to me another indication that Islam is right and the Christi later Christianity in deifying Jesus and making him the object of the message rather than Jesus' own message ha has gone astray. So how are you forgiven? By the forgiveness, God, God is forgiving. That's, his, that's one of his attributes. So God forgives whom he pleases. He doesn't need a price to be paid or a sacrifice because he is forgiving. Uh, and that's what Jesus taught, exactly the same thing. So there's no sacrifice? No. Not, no, not, we don't require a human sacrifice before God can somehow be enabled to forgive us. He is free to forgive whom he wants, according to his wisdom, according to his love, according so to his mercy. Just well, who is God? God is his character. He, in, in Islam, he has traditionally 99 names. So he is holy, just, merciful. He has names of rigor and names of uh, compassion and mercy, so he's both a god, a god of judgment and a god of majesty, and also be, a god. Sorry, sorry. Uh, just, how can you be a god of judgment? Yeah. There just seems to be no continuity between those two. As in, all I have to do is ask for forgiveness. And why wouldn't I just live the life I wanted to? Oh, doing because I want to do, and then just before I die, I just ask. For because is that really forgiveness? If I, if I, you know, if I if I ask forgiveness for God, and then I, and He forgives me, and 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 I don't respect God as well, and I just go on and defying Him and doing things I know displease Him, then I'm not taking God seriously. You know, I, it's not just that God is loving; He also has laid down 
uh, laws and guidance by which we live for our success in this life and in the life to come. Even if I don't understand, for example, God has prohibited pork, both for Jesus never ate pork, Moses never ate pork, Muhammad never ate, ate pork, peace be upon them all. I may not understand why God has prohibited pork, but if I'm going to be a good follower of Moses and Jesus and Muhammad, I must obey their teaching, so you have to even if I don't understand it. Well. Of course. So if someone was dying, a week's left to live. It's pretty bleak for them, pretty hopeless. Oh no, you can. There's a, there's a saying in the Quran, I think, that uh, God will forgive you, give your sin until. Uh, the, I forget the exact wording, but until the very last moment before uh, the, the spirit leaves the body, you, know, you, you can't leave it. You can leave it almost to the end, but you can't. But the trouble is, we don't know where our end will be. You know, we could be run over by a bus, God forbid, or drop dead from a brain hemorrhage. But we can't just say, "Oh, I'm going to live 80 years, and then uh, in my last five minutes, I'll repent." We can't do that. We don't know. Are you, are you sure that you're forgiven? God promises His forgiveness to people who uh, turn to Him in the Quran. And, the, and the, the assumption here, of course, is that the Quran is true, that the Quran is God's word, God's final revelation to mankind. O on that basis, the, the Quran guarantees paradise to Muslims, uh, which is a promise of God, and God's promises are always true, that all Muslims will go to paradise. It's actually that promise. Yes. Well, I've read it, which is well known. No, 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 but you, oh. <laughs> Ah, that, good question. Now, no, I'm not, because, and this may seem par paradoxical, because there are cases of very bad people who've lived terrible lives, but towards the end, they came to their senses and turned to God and were admitted into paradise. There are those also examples of very pious people, good Muslims, Salamakum, good to see you, Alhamdulillah, good to see you. Uh, there are examples of um, good Muslims, pious people, prayed and fasted and gave to charity, but who in the last part of their lives turned away from God and uh, rejected God. And so you can't predict, you know, we say God willing, I will go to paradise, but it depends on us remaining steadfast, steadfast until the end. Uh, and there are parables in, G in the Gospels that say the same thing. Uh, you know, we can't just sit on our laurels and think, oh, yeah. well, I'm saved. It doesn't matter what I do. That's not, that, that, that's, that's not taking God seriously uh, at all. I feel like, personally, the message of Christianity there is more, there's more sure it's hope now. As in, you can never be sure about it because I believe that Christ has died and was raised from the dead. Yeah. On account of my sins, he took the, the place I deserved. Yeah. And I believe that's 100% something that happened. Is that what you No, I hope not. Uh, <laughs> didn't, I don't, I think, I don't. Because I'm certain that that has happened and it's objectifiable, then I can be assured now. That, yeah, forgiveness is assured, yeah. I, I mean, I hear that, but it doesn't, in my view, it doesn't really uh, fit with what Jesus taught, what you just said. He, he didn't teach that only through his death and resurrection can your sins be forgiven. Uh, for example, the Lord's Prayer, this is in the, within the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew's Gospel. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, and so on. This whole prayer seems to be premised on the idea that the Father is God, not himself. There's no trinity, uh, that there's one God, the God of Israel, and that he freely forgives those who call on him, who ask him to forgive their sins. On one condition, uh, you may remember, that uh, if you don't forgive your brother his sins, God will not forgive you your sins. That's the only caveat. But that's it, and, and that's the Sermon on the Mount. Um, um, so Matthew 6 is a... It's a passage where Jesus has called the disciples to him. Yeah. He's teaching them about what life as, as a Christian entails, the cost of discipleship, the cost of following him. In this passage, he's teaching them also how to pray. Exactly. And I think the, what he's saying about forgiveness mm. is that mm. how can a Christian claim to be forgiven of all their sins if they're unwilling to forgive those exactly. around them? The sticks of hypocrisy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't think it's... Yes, what, what well, no, my point is that, that forgiveness of sins is just offered by God. It's on the assumption that God uh, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who forgive us. So the, the assumption is that God will forgive us our sins as good Jews, as just Jesus' disciples were. We're not Jews, but he, they were Jews. And there's nothing. To, this has nothing to do with Jesus' death and resurrection. It's a straight appeal to a merciful God for forgiveness. Now that's very Islamic. It's not Christian in the later Pauline sense, 
of, ah, well, it has to happen through Jesus later, a sacrificial death on the cross for us. That's not what Jesus taught, that's what Paul taught. Um, Jesus taught something that is very consistent with Quran's teaching. I mean, in a well-known phrase, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, no one can come to the Father except through me. Yeah. It's like Christ is making a clear claim there. It's only through him and his sacrifice, which he knows is going to happen, mm. that anyone could come to, anyone can approach a holy God. I think, like, yeah. because God's holiness, ultimately, as, as a Christian, I believe that God is holy beyond what I can even imagine. Well, Muslims obviously believe yeah. that too, yeah. So I don't think that you can just wink at sin and say, oh, don't worry about it. It's not winking, it's called mercy. Mercy is much richer and profounder concept than winking. Well, no, <laughs> it's not winking at all. But there's no balance these things, justice and love. Okay, yes, God does love us, but he's also just. Yeah, you, can't, you can't just say, look, he's... Okay, no, but, but, but but no, no, it's not just forget, but Jesus himself quoted this, quoted God saying, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. God requires mercy of us because he is merciful. He does not require, he does not demand sacrifice. I, listen, he says to his disciples, I demand mercy, not sacrifice. I require mercy, not sacrifice. Yeah, but and, I think this is, when, this is sorry, No, well, I'm just saying that the core of Jesus' message was not one of demanding uh, uh, perfection uh, and demanding uh, ritual sacrifice or human sacrifice but calling people back to the mercy of God but also a call to holiness as well and a warning about hellfire. I think the point that you're making about not demanding a sacrifice, yeah. so within the context where the sacrificial system within Judaism has been abused and people, there, there's no heart in the sacrifice at all, people are living a life of sin and then making a sacrifice and thinking, oh, that covers all. I mean, look, Paul, I'll close. I need to go. I've got okay. a train at five o'clock. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to keep you. No, no, let me, I'll finish, then you can say something, then I'll go. No, no, yeah? okay, okay. Karen. I just think that the only way a holy God is approachable is through the sacrifice of Christ Jesus. I honestly, I do believe that. Um, I think it's the only way. Without Jesus, that you can approach. Lost. Yeah. It's the only way that you can approach it. But anyway, do you want to say anything to close? No, it, it's just that when I look at the teaching of Jesus in the earliest Gospels, for example, in Luke's Gospel, I never read what you've just said. He's all, the power of the prodigal son, the son who goes away, it's a parable, who, who does terrible things. He comes back to the Father, he's a parable about God. God doesn't demand a sacrifice. He doesn't demand, um, oh, hi, cool. Um, and this is typical of Jesus' preaching. He doesn't put obstacles in people's ways. Uh, he said, oh, you, you must sacrifice a, uh, a cow or a sheep or I must die on the cross. No, no, God is merciful. And that, that key concept of mercy, Rahma, is there in Islam uh, as well in a much more um, Christ-like way, if I put it that way, than I find it in Paul, for example. Yeah, and I think he is, he is merciful by providing a sacrifice for us, Christ Jesus. A human, a human sacrifice. Well, also his son, an eternal sacrifice. See, human sacrifice in the Bible is explicitly called by God an abomination. God will not accept human sacrifices. Uh, it's something that is completely haram I mean, uh, and accepted. The difference between us is that I would believe that Christ Jesus is the Son of God, whereas you would say he's a prophet. No, the idea of a human being being sacrificed for sin is something that is explicitly rejected many times in the Jewish scriptures. And the sacrifices that are accepted uh, are of turtle doves and pigeons and, and sheep and so on. Never human beings. Human beings are always said you cannot sacrifice human beings to God. And yet that is precisely the later Christian belief, uh, which is contradicted by the Jewish scriptures themselves. And that's another indication that there's something not quite right there, I would argue. No, I mean, if everyone was sacrificing people all the time, then yes, I would agree. But, I mean, these smaller sacrifices point towards one eternal sacrifice that needs to be made. And I mean, I would agree that this horrifying to think. Well, why, why did God prohibit human sacrifice sacrifices then in the Bible, if that's what his plan was ultimately? It doesn't, it doesn't seem to be consistent. It's to do with the person of God. So Christ is... He's God. human. Jesus is human. Yeah, but, I mean, Christians would believe that he's truly human and truly God. So you believe God died on the cross? Yeah. But, but the, Bible, the Bible explicitly says that God is immortal and doesn't die. It says it in 1 Timothy chapter 6. It says God is immortal. That means he, he cannot and does not die. And that, but that, but it's precisely what you do believe happened. A, a mortal being can't die by definition. Yeah, but I believe that he also has the power over death. And that is one in three, the Trinity. Hmm. So if God can't die, then we have a man who died on the cross. But the idea of a human sacrifice is prohibited in Jewish scriptures anyway. It doesn't quite fit. It's not a, a soteriologically coherent 
uh, a theology to have because it, it, on the one hand it's prohibited, on the other hand it's impossible. You believe in a prohibited impossibility. But whereas Islam simply says, as Jesus says, God is merciful and welcomes sinners who turn back to him. And that's the good news. The bad news is if we persist in our obstinate rebellion against God, then we'll be in the lost hellfire, basically, in the life to come. I just think there's no assurance in your message. Well, as I said, there is a promise in the Quran, uh, explicit promise that all Muslims will go to paradise. Now, they may. Uh, there's also the Muslim belief attested also that Muslims, some Muslims may go to hellfire. For them, it would be like a purgatorial experience. There may be some punishment, but ultimately, all Muslims, they believe in oneness of God, not a trinity, uh, and do not divinize or worship the messengers and prophets of God. They were, people who believe that simple thing will all go to paradise ultimately. Uh, and there is a promise by God in the scriptures to that. So there is assurance, but uh, yeah. God is eternal. Yes. And loving. Of course. It's called, it's called loving by God of love twice in the Quran. Twice? Yeah. But before Explicitly. creation, how do you think an eternal God can be loving if there's nothing to love before creation? Hmm. Well, say that again. Okay, so you believe that God is No, no, no. Uh, the, the very last part, because there was, there was a thing there. You said, say it again, what the, what the, uh, yeah, the problem so was at the end. How can God be loving before he created anything? See, th that's part of the problem, the temporal thing here. God is not a human being. He's not like us. Okay, he is a transcendent, okay, so eternal it's just an being. Characteristic. Uh, he, he has many attributes: uh, being loving and compassionate, being a, being a uh, the 99 names of God. Uh, someone who creates these. A creator as well. Can God be a creator before He creates the universe? Yes, He can. Uh, but God is not like a, a solitary figure like us. Who? Well, how can I be a loving person? I'm not loving someone. That's a very human, anthropomorphic conceptuality of God. God's nature is to be loving and merciful and, and be a creator and holy and just from eternity. He doesn't change um, and he doesn't die because uh, Muslims believe that God is immortal. That's also a belief uh, a witness to in the scriptures, the Christian scriptures as well. And the Christian belief that God died is not only to, to us blasphemous, it's also illogical. Uh, God cannot die. And also, Jesus doesn't know things. He's, he's ignorant to the day to the end. God knows everything. God's all powerful. Jesus was very weak. He didn't. He, might, he said on the cross, apparently, "My God, My God, why have you abandoned me?" So here was someone who didn't even know why he was allegedly being crucified. Um, well, uh, I would just say it's because for humans to approach God, we need a human sacrifice. But Jesus didn't teach that. Well, there's no sacrifice. Like for example, fallen angels yeah. can never be restored because they have no they have no sacrifice for their sin, whereas fallen humans can because we have a representative in Christ, the new Adam. But anyway, I really do need okay. to go. I'm so yeah. sorry. sorry. What's the nearest way to King's Cross Station from here? Uh, gosh, what by on by tube or how are you going to get there? I uh, can walk, but or tube. Um, okay, so you need to uh, get the there's a tube called Marble Arch on the central line here. Uh, you just go on the central line, eastbound to Oxford Circus, uh, a couple of t two or three stops, and then you get the Victoria line to King's Cross. Just a couple of stops northbound. Thanks so much. Good to talk to you, mate. Good to talk. See you later. See you.